Hello and welcome to College of Idaho Insights. Today we're here with Professor Steve Mon from the college's Department of History and Professor Kerry Hunter and Jasper Lacalzi from the Department of Political Economy. Today we'll be talking about education and Steve, why don't you get us started? Well, before we uh, began filming this morning, I was discussing bringing up a recent article in the New Yorker magazine from the, a late January issue by Jonah Lehrer called uh, Groupthink. And in it, Lehrer points out that the common technique of getting together people into rooms, brainstorming, no criticism as the ground rule, ultimately, when it's put to the test, proves not to be a very effective way to develop new ideas or creative ideas. See, Certainly, you know, my first introduction in, right. to this college, my very first day here, we did that. We had a dean that put us in a ballroom, and we did that. We wrote things on board, mm -hmm. and I had I, I intuited that this was a waste of time. Right. So. Well, psychological studies have shown, with data and control groups, that this is not a waste of time, but that it so is. So now science can tell us what is, we already know. But that it is inferior to getting people into a room where they present their ideas in a critical atmosphere, and they are in fact asked to defend them that when you get people together and the ideas are serious and in fact people right, think hard and present critiques of what they hear, that you get many more usable and valuable ideas. That I think is a really profoundly important insight for how education needs to be carried out. And one of the reasons why an education at a school like the College of Idaho actually has a higher level of efficiency than an online course where you're sitting alone and you're engaging with the material on your own or even online uh, discussion boards. To actually be in a room, to have to present your ideas, to need to be able to justify those. To have the emotional intensity of that experience forces you to think harder, to think deeper, and to think more creatively. Well, I think to have a, 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 a moderator is important, and that's the role of the, of the faculty member, I think, to, to, to present a challenge if, it, if it's not otherwise, to, to make sure it's, it, it, mm -hmm. it's the, the, the criticism working in a, in, a, in a productive manner, that I don't think you can just throw a bunch of 20-year-olds into a room and say, start, start having critical discussions because no, they're going work. in every direction. Well, and I think, I, I think you're right. I think you need to have structure. And uh, so, for example, in my European intellectual history course this year, we'll be reading several philosophers from Marx to Mill to Foucault. And for each of our discussion days, there's an expert panel. They have to present a defense brief for the uh, thinker. The rest of the class acts as a hostile jury. And I moderate as we explore those ideas in that more contentious kind of exchange about what they think what they may be right about, what they may be mistaken about, where the ideas might be applied, where they might be problematic. That is always a more productive intellectual environment. I and, and, and regardless of, uh, of how practical uh, or, or that they will ever have to deal with Foucault again. The, the, and that's what I always look at. That's important. That's what I always look at is it, it, the subject matter is important, but it's just as a way to engage you. Uh, but it's what you do is more important in the classroom than, than what the specific subject matter is. These are transportable skills right. to, to any environment. Though you do have to have the subject matter in order for the critical There's no substance. Place, right. if, if there's nothing important to talk about, then, then it's, it's, it's unimportant it's, talk. Right. It's just, yeah. But see, I, th I think it's, you know, we all do this in different ways. In my lower division classes, I have debates where you have students to go uh, uh, two against two and, and there they're challenging each uh, each other plus placed upon standing in front of a podium mm -hmm. and you have six minutes and you have to talk and it, it, it's it, with very mm -hmm. clear rubric on right. what you have to do it, it's very challenging and difficult and they yeah. hate it and so after right. they're done well and it's a, another interesting spin-off from this Lehrer article uh, our studies have been done on Broadway musicals and whether they are successful or not and what um, what uh, Success. What sociologists have done when they, when, and psychologists have done when they've looked at this, there's a particular study that was done where they looked at those who were involved in the production, those who wrote the music, who wrote the librettos, who were designers, um, who were choreographers. What they found was 
Musicals where virtually nobody knows each other very well almost always fail. Musicals where everybody knows each other incredibly well and have worked together previously tend to fail. It's a middle sweet spot where you have people who know each other, who have worked with each other, but there are also some people in the mix who are new to the group, who bring new ideas. Um, it's the sweet spot in the middle where people know each other, but also there are some who don't. And the diversity of thought within that framework of trust mm -hmm. creates this level of creativity. And when I read that, I was thinking about some of the places we have on our campus where these things happen naturally. I think, for example, the Boone Table. Um, in Boone Science Hall, we have a big table where math tutors routinely sit, but all of the science students and other people who are scheduled into those classrooms pass by that table, stop, have conversations. People will tell me that they have learned more um, at that table than they have in classrooms, or at least what they learned was more memorable because of the mix. I think uh, Howard Berger's bench, where you have a central figure and then you get a number of people who some know each other better than others, but they get together, provocative questions are asked and answered. Those kinds of environments have uh, a kind of magical quality to them. Um, yeah, I, no, I, I, I'm just thinking about this is the beginning of the semester, and so I've got a lot of new students that I've never had before. And then, and I also have my senior seminar, which are students that I've had a lot. Mm -hmm. And I I found myself already being much more engaged with, with the new students because we and I heard something from a freshman yesterday, uh, a take on Plato I have never heard before in my life. When I, the, the the question was what what does Plato believe is a, is a, you need to do to motivate people, and her answer was visualization. And I, I mean, the cave. Yeah, the ca yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had never thought of that, and I'd never heard anybody else think of it. But if you really want to get people to understand something, you've got to get them to visualize. I mean, contrasting that with rational logic, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Plato's a poet, which, and that, you know, the emphasis on visualization mm -hmm. um, was something, again, that got me excited. and the seniors that I, I mean, as much as I like them, we've seen each other, we've heard each other a lot. <laughs> and I'm guessing there will be less new stuff mm -hmm. come out of that than, than in... Uh, well, I often tell seven. seniors as they, you know, we come into this season, the springtime, they're feeling nostalgic and they're feeling a little sad about leaving this school, that if they're feeling a little bit sad about leaving the school, but they're excited about what is to come, they are ready to leave. And that one of the, the fascinating things about our job is just when people become real adults, as it were, autonomous, self-thinking, ambitious individuals, they leave us. Well, that's because, and I, I, that's when they start getting boring, too. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So that's the, and, and that's what I always say with the seniors, go, oh, give it. no, it's time for you to go. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them just want to hang around. It's like, right. no, Come we've done all we've done. done. Now. Come back to the alumni <laughs> events, right? Let's have a conversation. But there's only so much Once we you can have do. new experiences and new knowledge, because yeah. that's also an, an enormous amount of fun yeah. um, at an institution like this. The alumni gatherings, the five years out, the ten years out, the homecomings, to see what people have done, what they have become, that mm -hmm. is really wonderful and, and and what I always what always gets me with alumni who come back to oh, to campus they come back and they, well things haven't changed you know <laughs> <laughs> how little has changed they come to my office the three of us are, are sitting there talking and so and, 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 and um, uh, what is it Coakley and Easy said it, it, it's like um, Brigadoon. Brigadoon, you know, the whole rest of the world is changing, but we just stayed the well, same. Well, I think that's because despite a lot of the hand wringing about the fate of higher education and the fact that we're losing our minds and universities aren't doing their jobs, and you many are universities first. aren't, um, I think at an institution like this, we see 18 year olds and 19 year olds every year, and they, on a fundamental level, don't change. And so if you do what is best for their educational development, which is put them into challenging situations, ask them to think, ask them to read, ask them to justify, you're going to get similar kinds of results. So every year I'll have seniors who will say to me, what do you think of the freshman class? Those, <laughs> those jokers, I can't believe, they're, 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 they're nuts. Uh, and I'll say, you know, that's what the seniors said about you the year exactly. you came in. And it's not that... And then they're, no, no, not us. <laughs> 
yeah, 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 no. that way. And, and, the, and, and the other one, the seniors will say, there'll never be another class like ours. Yes, there will be. They'll be here in three months. You know, they'll be here in September. They're going to be just like, like you were. And, and, and the thing is, we, we approach it uh, approach it from a similar sense, but we, we keep on changing mm -hmm. how we do things. It, it, it's, it's, I think how I teach now is different than I did Absolutely. 18 years ago, uh, not just for myself, because I think that the students have changed. And too. they come and in with a different skill set. Right. I mean, they come in with an amazing access to information. They come in with an extraordinary technical um, set of, of facilities that they didn't well, have. Well, 15, the, the, the research years assignment that I use, when I first came up with, with that 15 years ago, Students had to go, okay, you have to find five journal articles. Well, that meant going through microfilm and, right. and, and all, all that they had to go through uh, the, the old bibliographic index to find stuff. Right. And now it's, it, it, it's completely different. What, what, what I find interesting is my assignment hasn't changed that much. I mean, what I asked them to look for, but how they look for it is, is, is it's completely and I, and different. What do you guys think? I, every now and then you hear someone say how... The, there's this trend of, of freshmen coming in less prepared. And I don't see that. I, I, I think they're prepared in a different way. Uh, I do think that there's an impact of No Child Left Behind upon public education in the way that schools, in order to meet standards, increasingly taught to testing in mathematics and reading and in it, particular. But, and you feel so, like you're sensing it when the freshmen uh, come there, in? There is no doubt that compared to 15 years ago, I have a far lower percentage of students who come into my classes who have written a term paper, who have written a sustained piece of writing that has citation and that has multiple sources of research supporting it. I used to have a lot of students who came in with that kind of experience. We have to teach that now because they don't get it any longer. That is an educational policy and political um, situation. But also, they come in, I think, with a very different set of reading habits. I, I, yeah, I wanted to say that, and I think they don't read mm. uh, much at all, uh, uh, anything of substance, much more And they uh, did blog. 15 years ago? I, I think, so. I think I, there were more. And again, this is, I think there are more students who came in. I, I think we see more students who come in now who say, if you ask them, they'll be honest, they'll say, I've never read a book. From cover to cover, I've never read a book. That was unusual 15 years ago because in high schools, people read books. If they're in English class, it might be a short little S.E. Hinton novel or whatever, but they read books. Many of them don't anymore. That doesn't mean they don't read. They read a lot of stuff. Right from Twitter posts to to Facebook to online blogs to Wikipedia, but it's a very different framework of reading. I think. I think the what I see too is when they do research, they don't look to books for for, for sources. Everything. If I have to leave my residence hall room, I don't want to have to get it. If I can't get it on my screen. It's, it's not worth getting. And I think one of the challenges we have is for them to um, decipher all this information and to determine what is um, reliable, if you want to yeah. use that word, mm -hmm. uh, that, they can, that they can use, where I think it was much easier before if something was, was, was a printed book from a, uh, from a reliable press that we would have in the library, you can pretty much trust that. Now you go to a website, who knows what's, who's writing it and what kind of... What kind and of I'm sure in, in, your, in your research uh, course, as I do in mine, you, you talk about peer, peer review, review right. or juried journals, which, well, of course, for many students is a, is a, is a foreign concept. But, but that's you one have thing, a panel of experts to have who invest in knowledge. But, but what about a website? When you go well, to a website, when, what's a reliable web website and what's not? And well, I think that's that's and that's why if how you, you train students to try and understand the difference between, say, university websites and commercial websites, to look into authorship on websites to see whether or not um, these are folks with credentials or if they're people with agendas, um, those kinds of skills are also very important. See, to take that critical attitude toward knowledge to the net is probably one of the most important skills that we can teach at okay, this point. Okay, so, so um, I, I agree with you and that it, indeed these students are, are reading different things and that sort of thing, but are they really any different in terms of their ability to read, that is to actually 
read and critically understand what it is they are reading. Maybe they didn't read books 15 years ago, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that students are no less uh, capable now, and there's because I think they were relatively incapable then right. in terms of what they were doing, reading, discerning, meaning from a, a, a no, book. No, no, I think you're right. I, I, I don't think that I don't basic think we... skill has changed. What's changed is, what's this thing in my hand that's very thick and filled with pages? Um, well, is that, what, is what that kind their of, problem or is that part of the art kind of, problem? What kind of strategy do you need to encourage them? I mean, because one of the, one of the, the things that I tell my first year advisees all the time and I think you do as well, Jasper, we've talked about this, is being a student is like having a job, and you should think about it as having a job. You have time commitments. You need to have a structured approach to your tasks. Right. That means that one of the most important things you can do is say, I'm going to set aside four hours on the Tuesday and Thursday afternoon when I have them to sit in the library at a table and do my work. And Jasper used to tell students that when his first year here. Yeah. And that, yeah. I mean, it, that hasn't... Right. That hasn't changed, but but the students are less likely to have the experience of having done that before. It's a I, new set of habits. Okay. So I think you're right. My I think point that, is that, that abilities believe, haven't changed. Yeah, my point is I don't believe that the school is going to hell in the handbasket because students are, are less. That oh, we're let, I and, agree. And, and yet I hear this from various different sources that, oh, nowadays college vital lets in everybody or... Educate, not just. It, if you look at some of our we, alumni, we used we, to let in everybody. Right, right. Look at our alumni who might be watching this. We, right, <laughs> but, but I've, I've out heard out. alumni say to us, "Oh, yeah, I heard you guys have no standards anymore." And I, what did Reverend some, Boone say though? You know, he said to let everybody in. Let them come, uh, let them all come, and we'll see what they can do. So he was doing and, that a hundred years ago. And, and my point is, I haven't been able to detect any kind of significant trend either upward or downward in terms of the quality of students. No, I, I, agree, I agree too, especially in, in the aggregate. It's a training issue. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, a, I, I agree, especially in the aggregate. That's what I always say. Class to class, each class is basically the same. The individuals are different, but when you roll them all together, they're about the, they're about the same. I mean, um, and, and I think it changes from year to year to some extent. I mean, you see it, I think, uh, uh, for our department better than, than other, Rob does too, in the senior seminar. Not, not every senior seminar is as good as, as, good as the others, right. but I mean, but from no, year to year. But there's no trend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it hasn't gotten any, any. That's the trend right. is, the trend similar. is, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, right, a, exactly. it's, right. Year to year, a set of variations. So what are some of the, the long-term effects on society of these, changing habits of or, or skills of students who are coming in, not just to the College of Idaho, but to, to higher education in general. Do you think we're going to see uh, some effects, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road? Well, I, I, I'm afraid that uh, what uh, a lot of people are looking for from a policy standpoint is how do we, how do we leverage this type of technology as, as a way to uh, accomplish education through distance learning, online learning and things like that. And, and I don't know if that really works in doing what we were discussing to begin with, the real uh, critical reasoning that, that we really do, that it has to be uh, an in-person type of environment in, in, in that we do here that I don't know how many, uh, in, in a bigger institution, in a, a distance institution, you can do this. But, what the, but part of what it's demonstrating though is the old model of teaching that is disseminating information, lecturing. I think this new technology is showing us that that kind of model is less and less relevant. Kids can go out there and have information disseminated via the internet. It's the role of the professor, the role of the teacher in creating critical thinking, creating this environment where you really are being challenged is, I think, it, in a sense, it's showing the importance of that particular style, that particular mode of education. Um, why do you need to sign up for a class where you're sitting there with 500 students 
during a lecture. You can well, and you really even good lectures online. Yeah, and, and, and you see the big universities. Not only is it just there, they put them on like a big screen right. now because they're so big. So how is that any better than watching it on YouTube? Right. Uh, right. how, because, especially when you get a, a multiple choice test is how you're going to have to respond mm -hmm. to it. As compared to, to, to writing a, a, a paper designed specifically for the information that you're doing that's, that's going to require critical thinking, that you're going to get significant and relevant feedback on. I, I, yeah. That's why well, I what, what, what doing happens is, in the classroom is, is enormously different between a classroom that has 20 students in it and a classroom that has 200 students in it, even 20 and 50. I mean, it's an enormously different experience, and I think what what faculty who who are effective at the college level bring are, are two things. One of them is the kind of enthusiasm and the kind of demonstrated sense of personal relevance of the material that this is incredibly important for you to grapple with and come to understand. There's something that happens on a level of human interaction, I think, in the smaller classroom that is not replicable mm -hmm. in the larger venues or online. But also, faculty members bring a framework. They bring a structured framework and they impose, dare I say it, a discipline. And that discipline is insistent that students achieve certain kinds of goals, and they do it to a certain kind of timeline. One and, of the and, real a certain, problems, and a certain rigor and uh, With a certain level of rigor and expectation of quality. Exactly. That is the particular set of skills that employers most want. Mm -hmm. And it's the set of skills that distance education and education in large classrooms doesn't necessarily develop in very well, strong then, then we ways. tell you, you must be here at 320, you must turn this paper in at this time, and I'm going to hold you to certain standards uh, at this, no, I, 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 I think it's important. I've heard advertisements on the radio for uh, uh, some some online kind of thing. You can get your degree easy. You can get an MA easy. It's e and, and, and that's the emphasis. Even you can get it, no matter what your are No matter how stupid you are, no matter how lazy you are, you, you can, get, can get, a, get a master's. How good can that be? Where well, I think we're, we're pushing, I, I think if anything, we're trying to be become more rigorous. We were discussing before with the, the, the new peak curriculum. If anything is be, is more rigorous, you, you well, don't. I mean, the great the great the thing we make you to have a, of the, a minor of in the each peak, area. Peak curriculum is that, and, and I was just talking with one of our um, prospective students the other day about this, and he asked me, "Well, what do you think? I mean, what do you think of the peak curriculum?" I said, "What has changed with the peak curriculum is I used to have conversations with entering students in which I said, "So, what are you interested in? So, are you thinking of majoring in that? Okay, here are the general graduation requirements. Let's figure out how you can jump these hurdles, how you can check them off, get them out of the way." And that's how students, and that's how students thought about it. <laughs> now, you come when you have students come in, you ask them, "What are you interested?" in? Well, what else are you interested in? Because you're going to have to get majors that are substantive. They are not simple distribution requirements. They are going to ask you to know a subject with depth and to have a content area of knowledge along with your experience of grappling with that way of knowing the world. And you're going to have four of those areas when you leave. That four is discipline. Four it's disciplined that approaches. Of discipline, mm -hmm. And right. it is an enormously um, it, it is it is both more rigorous, but it is also a system that gives the students right greater flexibility. It gives them greater ownership of their own education. Mm -hmm. It allows them, often with struggle, to craft this new kind of education. And a lot of students don't like it. I mean, this is the interesting thing. <laughs> I hear students complain about this is hard. You know, how am I going to fit these things together? How am I going to graduate in four years? Well, you have to figure that out. It's complicated, just like life is. So I really like the curriculum because I think it models in some ways exactly what people are going to have to face once they graduate and go out into the world beyond the college's campus. So what I what I like about it, what I, I've come across recently with, with, with some prospective students who have been interviewing, is it's, it's beyond just creating four programs that's going to advance my career. I had this young woman come in who was talking, she's very much in math and physics and stuff, but she loves playing the violin. So she's going to have a minor in music also. Not because that's going to necessarily promote her career, but that's who she is and what she wants to be as a person. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important thing, I think, where how Peak fits into a real liberal arts education. It doesn't just train you to do a career, a job in the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, It's about you being a, a, a complete person. Right. And this I, is, I remember the first, time I, the first time I ever really encountered what I think we're trying to do with Peak in, in, in a different sort of way is when I went to graduate school. Mm -hmm. 
And I, this is the first time I realized that I had to be in charge of my education. Right. Up until then, I just did whatever I was supposed to do. <laughs> uh, but now we have freshmen who come in here, and I think a lot of them have that same kind of mentality. Like in high school, they did with all of the requirements. They want us to tell them what the requirements are. No. you got to figure out what you're going to do with your education. <laughs> and initially, it can be a bit of a shock. But and you have over so ninety thousand choices. But, but that's but, it too. There's, there's but, ninety thousand permutations. But it also advances from the beginning. Exactly what we say we do, and other liberal arts colleges do, and that is ask people to craft themselves right. into real, fully exactly. rounded, lifelong learning individuals. I was just having this discussion in my European intellectual history class where we were talking about Friedrich Schiller, the great German poet and historian from the 1790s, and Schiller basically argued. The problem with the modern world, he had gone through really bad basic training experiences where he was sort of narrowed down to being a Prussian soldier, actually Furtenberg, I believe. But his argument was the modern world whittles us down to a job. It turns us into a function, and that destroys our humanity. We have to figure out who we are through play, through the creation of a semblance of our own selves upon the world. It's a creative act. And sure, we have to do a job. Sure, we have to have knowledge. Sure, we have to be trained to do something functional. But if that's all we are, we're nothing more than a cog in a machine. And our humanity is destroyed. And I think what the peak curriculum does is from the beginning it says, no, you're not just going to be right, a, an engineer. You have to be a real person in the world. Start figuring it out now. But what, what I think is also important with it, too, is it's, it's not just you will just come here and study English literature or, or history. There is a professional stand, standard in, mm -hmm. in peak to this too that we do expect eventually you will leave. And you and will you, have to feed yourself. You, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, you will not return to your parents' basement. <laughs> yeah. Parents, this should be something that's very, very attractive to you. We like alumni who are making some money. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's always true. Successful, take, autonomous individuals. That's who, what we're aiming who for. Who come and, and uh, uh, take us to lunch. I like the, those, <laughs> those types of alumni. Great. Well, I think we'll end on that note today. Thank you very much for participating in the see discussion. And we will yes. see you soon. Invite yeah. us to lunch. Yeah. <laughs>